Hi guys, we've talked about the 20th century and maybe now is a good time to talk about abstraction and representation. So let's start with these Monet Manet guys. Um, let's hop over to Manet's Olympia, 1863. So I've said that this painting is pretty focal because for a number of different people, it's, it's a really pivotal moment. Um, Eunice Lipton is, is thinking about gender. Uh, Charles Baudelaire is thinking about realism versus romanticism. And ultimately, those two perspectives may be the most important things we can say. However, for this particular story, it's really Clement Greenberg's perspective that um, is the powerful perspective on this painting. Um, so for Greenberg, uh, Manet was really a turning point in beginning to explore anti-illusionistic space. So what do we mean by anti-illusionistic space? So illusionistic sp So this painting looks pretty representational to our eyes. Um, if we go back to our man Bouguereau with his Birth of Venus, you know, these don't look all that different to us. It turns out that really on all three of these dimensions, in fact, they are different paintings. Um, and on Greenberg's formal distinction, you know, this is... Um, this is a very rounded, representational, uh, shaded, dimensional presentation. And, you know, this may not look too different to our 21st century eyes, but in fact, this is a much flatter painting. This is starting to go into abstraction. And that's why Greenberg looked back to this painting. Um, if we come to Monet, we see, you know, again, the painting that gives the name to the Impressionist movement, Impression Sunrise, a few years after Olympia. And obviously, this is a long ways from Olympia. Um, you know, it's now much more abstract, much less representational. And if we go to that guy whose name I keep mentioning without talking about Turner, um, you know, again, this is a representational painting. So when I say representational, I just mean representing something like a house or a tree or a person. So obviously this is a painting of ships at sea. The, the water looks turbulent, the sky looks stormy. So yes, this is representational. We know what we're looking at. But again, it's a different kind of work than something like this, you know, highly representational uh, Bouguereau painting. This is um, a more abstract, or this isn't an Impressionist painting per se, but it is Impressionistic um, in Turner's work. And, you know, Monet painting this work in 1872 is truly a visionary. Um, he's going to places that no one has really gone. And so to think that Turner did this 30 years before Monet, you know, if Monet is a visionary, what's Turner doing 30 years earlier? I, I don't know. I guess Turner's an alien or, or something. But it's really remarkable to have this work. Turner's interesting for a lot of reasons, but certainly that's a, a significant one of them. So we see, you know, the early seeds of moving into abstraction here. Okay, so um, let's go to Corbet. Now, as you recall from our, so here's his Stonebreakers painting. And as you recall, when we were talking about realism versus romanticism, and we we're talking about beauty, and actually right back to Olympia, um, you know, we mentioned that Baudelaire was tired of this romantic fantasy. He saw people, you know, sort of struggling, starving, and there's all this romantic fantasy. And so he challenged artists to depict real life, to, to, to work with a realist sort of approach. Um, and so th for, for Baudelaire, that's what Marent and Manet were doing. And again, um, Corbet, a very realist painter. I should note that when we talk about realism, this movement in painting, Corbet is very representative of that movement, but the word realism can be used in a variety of ways. And so we would also talk, for example, about photorealist painting, paintings that are so detailed, these gigantic canvases that you walk into a gallery and you say, wait, is that a photograph? And then you walk up to it and you say, whoa, that's a painting. So that's a very, is a kind of a different use of the term realist. And, and we'll say more about that in a minute, but anyway, just to be clear that don't get confused by the term realist. So in this, you know, realism versus romanticism and, and being honest about life story that we told previously, Corbet was kind of our big hero of that story. Uh, today, however, Corbet will not be playing the role of the hero. Corbet is going to take a different space. So here's what Corbet said to art students in 1861. 
I believe that painting is an essentially concrete art and can only consist of the representation of real and existing objects. It is a completely physical language that has as words all visible objects and an abstract object, invisible and non-existent, is not part of painting's domain. Imagination and art consist in knowing how to find the most complete expression of an existing object, but never in imagining or in creating the object itself. So he's got a pretty clear and pretty specific definition of what he thinks you know, counts and what doesn't. Um, I don't know that he's responding to Corbet literally, but for me, it's always been a kind of a response to this 1861 comment. 109 years later, the Korean-American performance and video artist Nam June Pike says, we are moving in TV away from high fidelity pictures to low fidelity. From Giotto to Rembrandt, the aim was fidelity to nature. Monet changed all that. And echoing a somewhat similar sentiment a few years later, the geometric abstract painter Bridget Riley offers us, at the end of his life, Monet painted his largest, grandest, and in many ways greatest paintings about virtually nothing, about looking into a huge expanse of water set with a few lilies in which unexpected colors appear in the depths or elusively in reflections. It is a most mysterious, extraordinary subject in which he invests all his experience and power. In the end, there seems to be hardly any subject matter left, only content. Okay, so there's a couple people really looking back to Monet and seeing how powerfully he's influenced things. But for all the people that Monet's influenced, I think it's fair to say that he probably didn't influence anyone more than Kandinsky. So here's um, a 1925 painting from Kandinsky. It's one of his compositions. He wrote, he titled a number of his pieces compositions, and he was thinking about the way music is composed and could that be part of creating a visual experience. Um, so, you know, if you think about a painting that's highly representational, uh, like a photoreal painting or like maybe our, our Bouguereau here, or a painting that's more abstract, right? We still know what we're looking at. It's still about houses and trees and people, or in this case, ships at sea. Uh, but it's not as sort of tightly photo, real-like rendered. It's much looser. And now Kandinsky's gone all the way. It's, it's, it's not about houses or trees or people at all anymore. It is about color and mass and space and shape. Um, so how does Kandinsky get here? Uh, this is a, a 1925 painting, but it's really in the first couple years of the 20th century that Kandinsky makes the, quote, leap to the non-objective. So certainly if we look through history, there has in fact been non-objective painting. But if we look at the modern trajectory, it is Kandinsky who kind of first goes to this new place where no one in the modern context has really ever gone before. Um, okay, so he sees these Monet wheat stacks, these, you know, sketchy abstract paintings. And Kandinsky offers us in 1895, he sees these and he says, the painter had no right, no right to paint in such an imprecise fashion. So I, if I might interpret, I think he just told us that Monet is a total hack and that the, that painting is crap. Um, but imagine that you go see a film and it's not very good. So you walk out of the theater, you turn to your friends and you say, wow, that wasn't very good. And now you walk across the street and you have dinner and, you know, you talk about whatever, the Lakers or something. Um, you're not going to talk about this film that wasn't very good. You move on. OK, but now imagine you go see a film. It's not just not very good. It's not just bad. This is like the worst film you've ever seen in your life. You're, you're bitter. You're angry. And in fact, it's not just the worst film you've ever seen in your life. It isn't even a film. Whatever box, whatever space you thought film fit in, this isn't there. This is somewhere else. And this filmmaker, just that, that she or he thinks they're a filmmaker at all, you know, no, this is not even a film. Well, you're not going to walk out of the theater and say, okay, that wasn't very good, and then go talk about the Lakers. You're going to be ranting for the whole dinner, right? What did this person think they were doing? They're, they're, what a hack. They don't understand a thing about film. Okay, so I'm thinking that's Kandinsky with these haste, wheat stacks. Um, but if you think about it, you know, so we have a lot of films that are kind of in a similar sort of space. Sometimes we look at maybe alternative films that are a little bit different, but they still exist in a certain substrate of how we tell narrative films or whatever it is that we're going to do. And 
if you see some film that's really somewhere else, it's like a different kind of filmmaking. It isn't even filmmaking as you understand it. Well, maybe it isn't film, but maybe it's a, a bold new vision that was so far outside any box that you could perceive that it takes you a while to get there. And so maybe you really hate it and maybe that's as far as you get, but maybe you're willing to say, you know, why does that stupid movie bug me so much? And if you really, you know, dive in, you may discover something about the nature of film or what film could be. And I think it's that kind of experience Kandinsky has. Um, I think he hates Monet's stuff enough that he asks himself why, and he comes to have an epiphany about what it is that painting even is. And so still in the very same year, 1895, six months later, Kandinsky makes an entirely different statement about Monet's wheat stacks. Now he says, I had the impression that here, painting itself comes to the foreground. I wondered if it would not be possible to go further in this direction. And in less than 10 years, Kandinsky will go further in this direction than anyone has ever gone before. So I think it's, you know, it's a great story of being willing to grapple with something uncomfortable, to be able to see art that you don't understand and you don't like, but instead of just dismissing it, you dive in and you say, what's going on and why does this upset me so much? And ultimately, in Kandinsky's case, an enormous epiphany comes out of that. But what this epiphany is, is this idea that these representational paintings, you know, yes, they're accomplished, they're technically excellent, and they're a window into some world, a, a real or, or romantic world, but it's, you know, the, the gold frame is the window that you dive through and you go into that place. And these paintings, as we move away from that space, become about the surface. So it's not a window anymore, it is understanding the surface as a place where color and mass interact and, you know, confront each other and I, as a painter, explore that surface. And so the founder of the suprematist movement a few years later, Ken, uh, uh, Kazimir Majewicz, offers us that color and texture and painting are ends in themselves, that it doesn't have to be a window to somewhere else, that we can simply exist with that color and texture, and that that is the most fundamental primal part of painting. And he asks, you know, if the masters of the Renaissance had discovered the surface. They didn't discover the surface because they were busy painting some other world inside. But what about the surface? So um, let's, okay, so let's hop forward and just spend a moment with Wayne Thiebaud. So here is a woodcut by Thiebaud uh, made at Crown Point Press in San Francisco. It's called Hill Street. It looks like a San Francisco scene, right? We see tall buildings. We see a road. We see a hillside. So this is a representational paint, uh, woodcut in the sense that we know what we're looking at, but it's pretty abstract, right? I mean, it's definitely not photo real. We would never think this was a photograph. Um, okay, so why so stylistic? Why so abstract? Uh, so Thiebaud offers us, I try to downplay subject matter because I'm afraid it limits how people think about pictures. So when we go see that photoreal painting, we're amazed at the technical ability of the painter. Maybe even, you know, sort of we fetishize that, that just incredible talent. But is that the end of the story? Is it like, wow, it's incredible. Yeah, okay, next. Um, and he wants to give us more. He wants to give us not so photoreal, but somewhere else to go. And so Thiebaud says, um, ambiguity is as important as specificity. It becomes a beautiful dialogue, a tightrope walk between abstraction and representation. And so I may have billed this as sort of abstraction versus representation, but for sure it's not a binary either or kind of thing. It is exactly the, the tightrope walk that Thiebaud describes or a dance between them. But in works like this, you know, we see really both at work at the same time and giving us uh, the ability to see uh, a representational subject, but also the ability not simply to understand what the thing is and be done with it, but to dive in and look at his uh, graphic style and his use of space and his working with color and so on. So it's a little bit about abstraction and representation. <laughs>